。まもなく、まもなく、振り出しポットが参ります。ご注意ください。No, because I want to. Yeah, something, something, something I wanted to ask you about since you you brought up kind of、yeah. like the the broader corporate culture in the games industry, and also I think this is indicative of like the Valley period, which is that like. The, wait, the Valley being what? Like like Silicon Valley, like the 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 entire、oh, like, Silicon Valley,、okay. the entire like tech blob. For lack of well, because in LA, the Valley is considered like North of、oh, yeah, LA,、yeah. and so my. Yeah, my brain literally was like the valley. <laughs> you, live in, you live in the Bay Area. I thought you assumed that. I, anyway, I live in. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Anyway, no, because、so. <laughs> we don't call it. We don't call it the valley. That's why. <laughs>、um, okay, well, that, that's just me revealing、okay. my my parochial Midwesternness. Okay,、um, you live in the Silicon Prairie. <laughs> the Silicon Prairie? No, no, we're the. <laughs> that's what they called it. No, 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 no. It's the Creative Corridor. Is, is, I know, is what but it was、called. also the Silicon Prairie back in two K fourteen. It was. <laughs> well, I have to say about that. That's my entire feeling set of feelings about that. <laughs> okay, you can take it. No, because all these,、want. like all these, okay, because all these terms, like you know, like it, it's all bullshit. I mean, I mean, no, Silicon, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, even even like Silicon Valley is kind of bullshit because. For various reasons. No, the the thing that I want to anyway, ask, please ask me your question. No, the question I was going to ask you about was so I was recently reading about like the the con not the ma- it's not even a mass exodus from Blizzard anymore. It's like this constant exodus from Blizzard, like this massive storied company that supposedly what is the one that has like the history and all of the people who are committed to it for years and years and years. Now even like original co-founders are leaving and starting their own studios. And I remember, like, we talked a long time ago about how one of the weird ways in which, like, the games industry and academia are similar is this sort of tendency, this sort of mercenary attitude that people often have, where like they're constantly moving between, you know, from one project to another. They only stay with a, you know, a company long enough, essentially, for like the production cycle for a particular game or maybe you know, series of games. And so you end up. With a lot of companies that don't even really have a culture, except for like on paper, they're just sort of like temporary assemblages of、yes. persons. Yeah. Yep.、But、I was wondering what you think about that, and like、yes. whether or not that's productive, or like wh- what are the positives and negatives of that? Yeah. So I think that like back in games early history,、um, and obviously having not been in early games history, sort of like, and when I say early, I am not talking about early games, nineteen sixty, nineteen seventy. I am going to reference back when you were working、games. for Atari. <laughs> yeah, back when I was working for Atari. <laughs> no,、um, I'm gonna a little bit, a little bit like Atari or Midway. Like you know, I've read my video game history course books.、Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.、Um, but basically, like if you look at like the history of video games. A lot of that mercenary attitude really did come from right games being new, games being something、okay. that everyone had to like. It was it wasn't easy to get into, kind of had to know somebody. But that whole culture, right? It still really hasn't changed, and it hasn't changed because those people are still alive. Like,、yeah. so when I mention like early games history, you have to be thinking of these people that have the thirty, forty, or fifty year fifty years in games. I don't even know if. Someone has had fifty years. I don't know if games has been around fifty years, but I'm sure there's someone somewhere. Yeah, I think、and、that like, most of those people would probably be retired by now. Because yeah, so like, those, they're retired and maybe、yeah. they're making books, right? So they're、yeah. writing books about how、yeah. they started their studios, right?、Um, so fifty years, right? We have these people that are writing the literature because once you retire, you write literature about what you've done, right? Yeah. And maybe if you're really super forthrightful, you decide to write about what you would want to do if you were fifty years younger and you want. To start it all over again, I haven't、yeah. seen that book yet, but I would love to.、Um, I believe Sid Meier actually just did his memoir,、um, yeah, as well that just came out that I haven't read yet, but a lot of my colleagues have like enjoyed. 
Yeah, I don't and, know. How I, 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 sorry, go ahead. I don't know. How much, I was just going to say, I don't know how much you know about like the early history of Firaxis, which was so, and also like the, the early, I know, so I'm a huge SimCity fan. Um, Ooh, I'm a big, I mean, a lot of Sid Meier's, I mean, I'm, I, when I was a kid, I really loved Pirates. Pirates was a great game. It still is kind of a great game. It's sort of corny now, but still fun. Um, but Firaxis was interesting be, from what I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was a sort of like, I don't want to say it was like the first indie studio, but it sort of was, a, it had a lot of the elements that sort of then later bled into the sort of like indie studio or like indie developer mentality. Yeah, so I kind of, that's kind of what I'm getting at when we look at like business development and you mentioned like Silicon Valley you have something that's called the startup mentality and the startup mentality is like fail fast, right? And find your success first and yeah. find it really quickly. And honestly, in games, like that's kind of necessary. It's fail fast, then find the fun. Yeah. And it's kind of permeated all of history. And then you end up getting some really great games that take 10 years to make. So Circa, right? Blizzard, yeah. is what you mentioned. And you could say they're not really failing fast in air no. quotes, scare quotes here because fail fast is a, is a, it's not a terrible methodology, but I just don't think it's a sustainable methodology. Well, and also, so and that gets to, into the n nature of culture as well. Yeah. But to use the example of Blizzard, like the, the games that they've had the greatest success with are the ones that have a lot of longevity. I mean, their, yep. their, their most successful game, I mean, nobody wants to admit this, but their most, well, maybe some people would, but their most successful game is World of Warcraft. And the reason why that yeah. game is so successful is because of its longevity. Like it's an old fucking game now. And in many ways it's not well, well, great. Well, as old as new again, last <laughs> year, WoW Classic came out. I am yeah. actually speaking to a huge WoW fan. So like, this will be really exciting for you. you I really I used like to be. I, I, I yeah. used, like, I really. No, we all feel your pain. Every WoW fan's like, oh, I really used to like WoW. And then like Cataclysm happened. Yeah, basically the or, transition from, yep. from, um, Wrath of the Lich King to Cataclysm did me in, especially because in every MMO I've ever played, you know, even going all the way back to like stupid EverQuest, like I always play healers and healing in WoW for the longest time felt like it was powerful. Like in most games, healing is, feels very underpowered, very underpowered. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I love Final Fantasy 14, my primary frustration with that game is that healing is insane. Like it's real. It's just, it's really unforgiving, extremely unforgiving. Like if you if you mess up like one cast, it's a wipe. It's a great yeah. <laughs> thanks, no, guys. I, I, yeah. <laughs> whereas whereas in especially like so, f it's like well I mean okay so healing in vanilla was not great basically because the only healer was a priest. Everyone, yes. well, or paladins if you were alliance, because paladins were very good tank healers. We had a we had a shaman healer once. That wasn't too bad. Oh, that's true. Shamans were much better, um, like AOE yes. healers. But also, like vanilla didn't require that much AOE healing. Not really. Yeah, but if you had a shadow priest, you would have a shaman healer. Yeah, that's what's because true. then you could always have your backup priest and just like swap. Because I actually was a primary healer, but my main spec was shadow. Okay. And I say this because. I say was, and I say this kind of sarcastically, uh, or ironically, if you will, because this was last year of 2019 when I was playing WoW Classic. <laughs> I, played class I played Classic for a couple of months, too, actually. I leveled I, a priest. I put, oh, we should have we hit each other up, because you could have been in my, my Discord guild. Yeah, I now switched over to like Fall Guys and Among Us. Because <laughs> yeah, the problem is that it reminded me of everything that I hated about Classic. Like, especially compared yeah. to modern MMOs, like the grind was just so... Oh, it was tedious. horrible. Yeah. So, but, okay. So looking at Blizzard's longevity of, right, of their game titles and their... Well, like Starcraft. Is, Starcraft has a lot right? of longevity. Yeah. No, Starcraft, Diablo, every game that they did had a lot of longevity. Honestly, even Warcraft did. Yeah. And I don't think Blizzard was expecting World of Warcraft to take off like it did. Um, Maybe, yeah. Particularly. Right. I, I really don't think so, because when you get into any sort of game, you don't look at your game and think like this is the game that is going to make us a billion dollars. True. Yeah. Right. You, you're like, this is the game that's going to have like maybe a million players. Now we are there are companies, though, looking at games that are in the AAA sector. And there's even laughingly like something called Quad A, which is a great it was a nice, nice joke. 
Um, but like the triple A sector where you're going to be making billions of dollars from a property and you're going to yeah. have 24 million sales and 24 million players on any given day. Yeah. And in those types of properties, this is really where I see like this schism happening is because whenever you have, right, the multitude of masses, right, or the multiplication of it, where it's from like 10 people are going to play your game to 100,000 yeah. people to a million people, you suddenly have a higher amount of expectancy for meeting your deadlines, you have a higher company, like amount of people that need to just be there, bodies in the room, because yeah. there aren't enough tasks for any one person to complete. And then that yeah. is what gets down to culture. Because a lot of studios, when they were founded, were probably founded on that startup indie mentality of the fail fast, right? We're going to get agile. Yeah. Yeah. And they were a lot smaller. And honestly, a lot of the best kind of creativity, I think, does come from those smaller teams. From a lot of my business development coursework and even in my master's program, we did a lot of these um, kind of like what is the most like creative versus like what gets the most stuff done. Yeah. And basically there was like skunk works where like there was no oversight, right? Waterfall where everything is right. Very, um, you know, it's for it's a factory, yeah. right? Method and kind of like agile where it's supposed to be this mix of both. But the production methodologies, game development methodologies, like none of this is formulaic. So there isn't really any one solution that can even solve task management. And because every property and every game is completely different, there isn't even say one type of like culture or one type of production cycle that yeah. actually can accurately predict everything. And so when business falls, right? Yeah. And starts to fail to execute its deliverables or fail to do things, then like say the business like overlords decide to t take over and scare quotes again, yeah. but kind of look at it and say, how can we solve this from a business perspective? They're not thinking about it creatively anymore. They're thinking about it from a business perspective because now it's sheets on a line, right? Yeah. And this isn't necessarily bad, but when we look at culture in like say all companies, we look at culture specifically in games, you now realize that as soon as the creatives, right? are no longer allowed to do like the skunk works are no longer allowed to kind of report back up, but have that creativity. They don't no longer creating art. They are just executing tasks because yeah. at the end of the day, a lot of game development has hard skills, but your soft skills, which I would consider communication and art and all of that. And I don't like them being called hard and soft, but for the purposes of an audio podcast, <laughs> we can delineate between the two. Yeah. That level design is a hard skill. It has soft skill components like presentation of elements and has more artistic flair, but just like code, level design is a hard skill. You have to learn and understand what goes into those practices, right? So, and maybe so I'd, sir? I'd like to interject here because I think maybe um, a more meaningful distinction here would be that sort of there's a spectrum between sort of more like mechanical tasks and more creative tasks. Yes, and that, yeah, and that, and that if, better. And that if you look at like all of the various like jobs, or I guess you could say divisions of how like game design is broken up, you can generally place someone somewhere on that c continuum between like having more mechanical or more creative oriented tasks. So like someone who's doing say like writing dialogue or doing voice acting, they would be much further down on the like creative aspect. Whereas someone who's doing say like, I don't know, maybe even like doing like models is sort of like dead center because it sort of like splits the difference between like the, the creative aspect and the mechanical part. Right, and right. then someone who's doing scripting is like, you know, way, way over here. No, exactly. And so, but there's even with scripting and with coding, there is a little bit of creativity involved. If say you're creating something like a new feature and now suddenly you're back in the dead center and a lot yeah. of game design, which, which I love happens in the dead center. It happens in the middle of creativity and mechanical, right? Yeah. And what ends up happening when culture goes awry, what I would argue is that everything becomes mechanical. There is no more creative. Creativity has been outsourced. And so whenever you start outsourcing creativity, where it's the productions or business or someone calling themselves a director, whenever you outsource creativity, you are now outsourcing your culture because culture is something that's very creative, right? It's really led from the heart. It's what you value. Yeah. And creativity is a value. So if you take that value away, now you just have a bunch of mechanical, right? And the mechanics yeah. are robots. A robot could plug in, say, numbers that you get from your boss's spreadsheet. A robot could model right? It's not going to be very good because there is still some creativity needed. But yeah. if you're like, go AI program and model me an amazing character, it, it's going to do it because it's math, 
right? Yeah. The program is mapped. Well, I mean, plus like, you know, AI can build levels as well. I mean, that's essentially what yep. most modern roguelikes are. They're, you know, there's generates levels. Ooh, and every every procedural generated level designer slash roguelike designer just like <laughs> turned over in their procedural grave to start the next level. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> There's a lot of level design that goes. No, into no, I know, I know. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's part of the problem. Is that like I it said? Is, it, yeah. I should apologize because I I don't actually think that. I mean, I don't. Know I know you I, don't think it. That's why I brought it up. I was like, ahem. <laughs> <laughs> You're you're moving over into the the snarky mode that you tend to no but the, okay but but here's the thing like the, the point is still sound like the, the, it's it's the same thing it's like it may not necessarily be good but like it can be generated in the same way that yes. models can be generated and in the same way that like di even dialogue can be generated although generated dialogue tends to be really awful in a way that like generated models and d levels don't no ab absolutely and so here is where i get to the heart of the of the of the culture dialogue dialogue discussion that we're having is that whenever creativity is taken and everything becomes mechanical these people are leaving these companies because as a creative you think let me see how this plays out right like yeah. let's let's figure this out maybe i can be creative in different ways or maybe i can apply this in a different way but then you realize when it doesn't work and the culture starts to break down and or at least deteriorate right and it no longer aligns with your values well then you have no choice but to leave and to establish in a culture with people that share those values and share that culture and personally i really like this kind of approach and i like seeing a lot of this kind of i don't want to call it an exodus because it's not Maybe that's what's happening on some front, but on I think that's what's happening to Blizzard. I don't think it's what's happening in general. Yeah, um, I haven't actually. Um, I mean, Blizzard gets a lot of press. Uh, having a lot of friends in Blizzard, I don't know if they would describe it as an exodus either. Um, so I'll have to certainly, talk certainly to from the outside back, looks like an exodus. Essentially, but from I the mean, outside, it looks like an exodus. I mean, especially when like Morheim left to start his own studio, like that's kind of a big deal. Like when when literally like one of your core people from like the beginning history of your company has had enough. I mean, it may not necessarily like signal the great downfall of Blizzard that so many people on YouTube are talking about now, which I think that's BS, but yes. it does mean that it's a very different company now. It is. Um, and I think the issue, whenever you see someone leave a company, you need to remember that it's not that it's a very different company because they left. It is a very different company. And that is why they left. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people kind of look at someone leaving and then go, oh, everything's going to change. Actually, everything's going to stay the same. That person is now leaving to go do something different because they no longer could affect the change they wished to see at their current company. Yeah. Right. So yes, he left, but like, it's not going to be the downfall of Blizzard because like he probably wasn't in charge of a lot of the things that are actually leading to its rise. Well, Blizzard, so, all, yeah, Blizzard, also makes, gonna, Blizzard makes too much money to fail. It's, it's essentially like the game's equivalent of too big to please fail. Please don't fail. I love, I love you <laughs> all of my friends that work at Blizzard and I also love what you're doing. Again, I have ambivalent feelings. But also about, Shadowlands. Yeah. I have ambivalent feelings about Blizzard. I mean, I no, actually the thing is like, I'm, when I heard about the, the Shadowlands delay, I thought that was actually positive because it, it means no, that that someone, super positive. someone finally said like, oh wait, no, all of this feedback that we're getting is really bad. <laughs> like it's, we can't ship this game in a couple of weeks because like there, there are things that are broken. And someone yeah. finally said, like, no, we, we have to delay it. <laughs> and the thing is, Blizzard has done this before. It's not like this is earth shattering. Like they did this with um, Burning Crusade. Burning Crusade no, yeah. was delayed precisely because it was, well, not that it was broken. It was basically unfinished. Um, and then they took the time to finish. And Burning Crusade was actually quite good. Um, it still had all of the wow problems, and which I can get into, but I don't really want to right now. Um, but as a WoW expansion, as the first WoW expansion went, it was a huge success precisely because it built upon a core that was already there and then it mm -hmm. expanded it. And I yeah, think, I actually came in on Burning Crusade. And I think where Blizzard has failed is when they try to, like when you see saw like the huge subscriber drop off between um, Wrath of the Lich King and Cataclysm, and then also shortly after the release of Mr. Pandaria, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that people felt like it was a radically different game. 
Like mm-hmm. it, was, it wasn't expanding upon something that already existed. It, it had sort of changed it fundamentally. And some people liked that fundamental change, but a lot of people who had over the course of several years had gotten used to something else were like, I just don't want to play this anymore. Like this is too different for me. Yeah. So I actually had that come up in an interview once where someone was basically like, Hey, so I see that you play. Wow. And I was like, why? Yes. How, how may I be of assistance? <laughs> um, and it basically came to how do you think, what did you think about, you know, world of Warcraft's fundamental change after cataclysm? I personally love those types of changes, but what I don't like to see is the user base drop off of just as a game designer. Yeah. And so like what I would have done from the start was always to have had a vanilla or say like a non a pre-cataclysm server, if you will. Yeah. But as a player and as like a, I guess as a human, I love change. I've had change all my life. So I'm actually very comfortable when things completely change around me. But then after a while, if it sticks around <laughs> COVID, um, I actually, you know, don't like it. And uh, I'm suddenly like, wait, I my core fundamental of loving change is now being called into question because this is not the right change that I, I wanted. Um, and so I loved Cataclysm. I loved the change. I actually, I kind of dropped after Wrath of the Lich King as well. And that was just more because of like studies and just lack of like gaming computer in college and like other things like that. Yeah. But I didn't really pick it back up until wait, like until Classic. I basically was playing retail before Classic came out. And yeah, I didn't play again until Classic either. Forever. Yeah. I mean, I, I just funny because Oh I no, that's not really true. That's like... that's that's not true. Sorry, I am lying. I am a liar. <laughs> I played It's okay, we all lie. <laughs> I played Legion briefly. Oh, I'm playing Legion right now and I actually really love it. Like so funny story is that People go back to classic and they played exactly like things that they wanted to do. Yeah. I ended up just really wanting to have that guild experience. And so I got like four of my friends together and then five. So we would have like a dungeon group. And then yeah. basically like this is back in the day where you just needed five alts or like five other humans. And we ended up getting like, I think eight or nine humans to get a guild. So we had 10 in an alt. Uh, to put like 10 people to make this guild with our 10 silver, like very much getting on it. But I actually played a priest. I'd never played a priest before. And I played undead. I'd never played horde before. And so I didn't get any of that. You literally, you literally played from... an undead, undead priest. That is what I, I, that is what I played. An undead yeah, I played an undead priest as well. Oh, you know what? Undead priest for the win, because every yeah. single person I know that plays undead priest is like super legit so we're the elite i don't know if i don't know if i was legit the only thing that i have to know you as a person are legit oh, okay. whether or not you were legit and wow it's totally debatable my only real accomplishment was back in vanilla i made general that's it okay that's uh, pretty good and it was weird because right? I, I made yeah it's um it's the pvp thing i yeah. did not pvp like once so general is the if I remember correctly, it's the rank just below. So it was rank 13, essentially. I was trying to remember the term for it, but I, I made rank 13. So rank 14 was the highest at the time. Um, but I did it as a f- level 59 character wow. because, I, yeah, I played entirely in the 50s bracket. And I was able to grind a lot of honor because there was this regular group that we had on on Horde that, um, yeah, we, we sort of like we gamed the system back before like the, the modern iteration of like classic PVP is just insane. Like people who essentially like while PVPing are staring at spreadsheets and it's like, Oh, I've hit honor cap and then we need to boost you. And no, now we need to boost you. And it's just like, I can't, no, it's just not fun. It's it, cause it's all about like gaming the system rather than actually like playing. And that was just, that, that to me that was what yeah was that's a whole, whole another podcast episode is gaming yeah. the system versus playing the system like, but... and so so this is and so this is kind of part of the reason since both of us have played mmos in the past it was one of the reasons why i wanted to talk about final fantasy 14 because i was a skeptic um not part many of the reasons have to do with sort of a lot of the aesthetic choices the game makes like most of my gripes with the game are about Okay, so the, the thing that bothers me the most, and I don't know, maybe this is appropriate or inappropriate, but so like every single, either like pants or shorts or anything that has like a defined crotch for like female models has like the most egregious camel toe you could possibly imagine. It's it's kind of weird. And it's why are you aw- why are you looking? It's it's. it's 
Because literally, okay, so it's the problem of, you know, okay, well, you can't see what I'm doing. So, like, maybe I'll, I'll mime it. Here. <laughs> so, like, the, the, the text. Maybe the, I'm glad I can't see it. The, the, the text, so the text that you read, so, you know, like, when you have a quest and, like, they, they do, like, you know, the Final Fantasy style cutscenes where, like, the, the model is no, mime talking and then, you know, there's the text yes. at the bottom of the screen. And so, like, the text is literally like where most people's wastes are. So yes. like you have to you have to look there if you want to read what is going on. Otherwise you're just gonna be like click, 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 click. And you no, can't see I, anything. I understand. No, but I, was, I, mean, I was joking with you. But gen but generally speaking, actually I like the um I do like the design with certain exceptions of the uh the gear in the game because like even low level gear looks kind of good. Like it, it looks nice. And and it made me think of like wow gear where you know you get like the first robe and it's just gray like maybe like a yeah. black band so I think, yeah so with with wow right they were trying to have you chase like the end game like the whole point was to just level up as fast as you could which was like five days if you're only leveling with like a group and really eight days is average eight full days so eight times 24 everybody doing the math outside of our rooms um and Final Fantasy, though, is about actually chasing. It is really more like celebrating the gear chase, which is why it's so aesthetic, right? Like, I love the costume designs of Final Fantasy XIV. Yeah. Like, I, I love them. Um, I, I, could I do, do not play Final Fantasy XIV, but all my friends do and are sad. I really okay. want to play Genshin Impact. We can. <laughs> I, could, I could probably do with like less bondage fetish gear. There's also this whole like subculture in the game of like instances that people like set up specifically for like domination chat and role play, and it's it's fine. I mean, that's you know. gonna be everywhere. That's gonna be. I'm sure WoW has it. We just haven't found it yet. Yeah, it's true. It's not. Well, it's not literally in in the like. The thing is, in Final Fantasy 14, it's literally like the first thing that comes up in the duty finder. Like, you know, you bring it up, you know, to look for a group, and it's like it's just this long list of like essentially like cat doms and cat femmes, and I'm like, oh. Okay, well, at least people are exploring their sexuality. That's nice. But I do need to do this dungeon. I <laughs> actually need to find a group to do this dungeon. Um, because, so, oh, because the thing is, to me, what's most interesting about it is how the, like, the main progression through the game is extremely story-focused. And it carry like, you can level from essentially one to max level, which is 80, um, but I'm only playing the free trial version. I'm sort of cheating at the moment because you can play a lot of the game just as, as a free trial. You can level up to 70 just, wow. with, just with the free trial version of the game. So I'm playing the main storyline and the main storyline is a Final Fantasy game. It's actually just like a multiplayer Final Fantasy game. And it's kind of great to be perfectly honest. And it's fast. Like maybe it takes as long as a final fantasy game but because that narrative thread runs through the entire progression like you actually can just grind like especially as a healer because i'm playing a healer like you can just grind dungeons and you can level like that because you will instantly get groups and the there's an interesting mechanic in final fantasy 14 where like the classes that are more desirable for groups at that particular time so like if there's a like a paucity of tanks, then tanks get bonus experience for doing dungeons. And so the thing is, this is pretty much always the case for healers because there are very few here. Like it has a really, really, really low quotient of healers in the game. And I think it's probably because of certain design decisions. So yeah, if you wanted to level as a healer, you could probably do it in like 24 hours. That's crazy to me, Easily. honestly. But at the same time, when we were looking at our metrics for leveling up um our our characters we were looking at that 24 hour mark as well yeah for, for one person right but unfortunately because of just um time and design decisions i i mean i always push for more than 24 hours because i like the long end game chase so it's kind of my thing yeah. but yeah we were also looking at 24 and it's because of the final fantasy it must be like the, the final fantasy like, comparable maybe um because I've heard Destiny 2 is also about 24 hours, but that's what's pretty level, fast, yeah, not necessarily yeah. level level. Because it's pretty fast versus WoW, right? And usual yeah. MMOs take like 60 hours. Like 60 is your is your good minimum. Whether it's oh no, like but it used to be it used to be even worse than that. Like one of one no, of yeah, one it used of to be WoW eight days. 
yeah one of wow's major improvements over like say everquest which up until wow's release was the largest mmo like mm -hmm. everquest the the leveling grind is crazy and you basically like and it's boring it's both crazy and boring because the fastest way to level in that game is essentially for someone who is like max level to take you to an area where there are like rapidly respawning mobs that are about you know anywhere between five and ten levels above you and just have you tag them and then kill them for you for hours and days and weeks i mean like that's that's a philosophy that's a thing Yay! yeah no. yeah yes. so well, okay so I've, I've told you i could i could rant on and on about final fantasy 14 both good and bad but i want to hear about i could I could rant a little bit only in that I will say that the biggest complaint I've heard about Final Fantasy 14 is because that growth is so fast and you get to the end game. The end game is a bunch of dungeons. And then in order to get the story, though, you have to play the dungeon. And I think most people would somehow prefer to be able to get to that narrative payload without actually having to find the entire group. Well, specifically, I say dungeon, but I mean raid. Like yeah. the raid is apparently so hard and so stressful, like you're saying with one heal. And if you fuck it up, you now are going to completely wipe. Well, suddenly you have to right now completely redo it just to get that story. And so if there was an yeah. easier or more accessible way to get that narrative, I think that WoW has done a really good job of that. That's all I can say on Final Fantasy XIV. Get obviously just okay. Cut that so topic I mean, I, now I, and is there, there? I mean, there's so many different. No, actually, but th there's there's an interesting point here. So one of the major fundamental. So we're talking about game design. So one of the fundamental like design differences between Final Fantasy XIV and um, World of Warcraft is the global cooldown. The global cooldown in WoW is much faster. So in WoW, the global cooldown is base uh, one and a half seconds. And I don't know if this is still the case, but you used to be able to reduce the global cooldown with haste. I don't think you can do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in, <laughs> in uh, Final Fantasy XIV, it's two and a half seconds base. Um, so, but the way they d design skills is that there's like, there's a set of skills that are on the global cooldown and there's a set of skills that are off the global cooldown. So the ones that are on the global cooldown are the ones that you're going to be using re more repetitively. So, you know, your basic damage spells, you know, your basic like threat generating, um, abilities, and then also like, you know, your basic healing spells, be they like single target or AOE. And then for most classes, and I think this is less true of healers, but for like tanks and for um, for, uh, for DPS, the off the global cooldown abilities have fairly low um, reset timers. So they have anywhere between, usually between like three and 10 second resets. So you can actually establish a fairly like consistent rotation and pattern. Um, with healing, because you, you basically have to be like hard casting at all times, um, the ones that are off the global cooldown tend to be like, oh shit buttons. So they tend to be like, um, you know, an instant cast, like full HP heal on an extremely long cooldown. Um, or there are things like, um, a mana regen ability that you can pop, um, that has like, I think it has a minute cooldown. At least that's true for like white mages. And it's also true for, um, astrologians as well. Um, but most of the time, you're just hard casting, especially as a direct healer, like um, a white mage, you're just cast, 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 cast. And if any one of those casts lands either too late or last or lands on someone who like is already healed to full and then like after the, the heal lands, they take a ton of damage, like you can wipe. And as a new player, I have to say that like healing is not only unforgiving just from like a mechanical perspective, it's also unforgiving from a social perspective. Because most people who are running dungeons, they want to like pull everything and AoE it down. And that is extremely hard on the healer. Yep. And like I have a lot of experience playing healers in a lot of different games. Like literally the second I started playing, um, it's you play a conjurer before you play a white mage. It just turns into a white mage after a quest. Um, 
I was like writing macros to make sure that I had focus targets and, you know, all the things that I know from other games that like, you know, make healing easier and more efficient. But in my case, it wasn't making it more efficient. It was making it possible. Like, <laughs> like, wow. like, like I had to do, I had to do all that just to be stressed out and succeed. Yeah. So I played a lot of like support classes is what I do. And I didn't play a full healer until WoW Classic. And honestly, WoW Classic is always WoW Classic. I should just say World of Warcraft. Yeah. World of Warcraft has always been known as something that made games like EverQuest and like Ultima like accessible. It made it yeah. available to a lot of people who weren't familiar with those types of properties, but also people who wanted to get into a game and were familiar with other types of games and then just came into the World of Warcraft and we're like I understand this and yeah there's a learning curve to it but I can understand it I can be a contributing member of say like society and I think that's kind of where WoW really continues to succeed is that where there's other games that have come out of it and other MMOs like Final Fantasy 14 that um, on some level they never seem to hit my marker of satisfaction for another MMO that I can play and I say that because I couldn't actually pay for WoW for a lot of it and so like I would get like WoW gift cards, right, for summer or for winter from my parents. And then I'd be able to play it for like the month or I would be able to play it for four months or whatever. Yeah. Um, like four months during the summer. There's only two months off in the summer, <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. Right? Like they came in three months, three months, like cards, right? Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. you and could so get them in one and three months. You could get them months. in one and three months. And so that's yeah. how my parents kind of did it. And so that's how I would do it. And, but right in all of those downturns before World of Warcraft, I played all of the Aria games and R and that's A E R I A. And it could be area. Um, but R I, I say Aria cause like area is like area of effect. So for the purposes yeah. of this, it's Aria games. Yeah. And those were a bunch of like free to play free, maybe flash games that were not browser based, but you like downloaded them off of a website and they were free and then you just played them. And I also think that one of the games that I somehow got from this Aria games site was Shin Megami Tensei Online, which is also another MMO. Yeah. And it honestly, it could not be that to be completely honest with you. Um, because when you're a kid and you're just downloading all of these games for free, you're like, who cares about titles? I'm just playing 15 MMOs at once. Yeah, I'm cool. Um, but you had two, you basically got a demon as a pet. And by capturing other demons, you could fuse the demons together okay. to create something stronger, all within like a different world. And like the cities are all collapsing and you had to go and basically work with people or by yourself to level up your creature slash your, yourself and your skill level. And then through these combinations, keep basically keep going. And so that was the most, I bring that example up only because it was the most unique kind of area that wasn't like World of Warcraft. But then when you look at like Rift um, and you look at what was another, there was Rift, WoW, and there was like one more MMO um, that I can't think of. We'll also bring up Guild Wars 2. Um, but you look at all of those and I played all of those and I'm like, I love all of them, but I always kept coming back to WoW. I would still come back to the one month or the three months, even though I could try to play these other MMO properties because it was something that was unforgiving. It was like you had to work just a little too hard to play the game versus with yeah. WoW, you could get in, there was a rhythm, you got your rhythm going and then like you could play for days. Um, and it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's really hard to capture because even as a designer, I can make all the arguments for why WoW does it really well, but then I'll play something like Guild Wars 2. I'll go back or I'll just go back to Guild Wars and I'll go like, oh, but this has it too. So like what makes one more accessible over the other? So with WoW, the I mean, the thing that you can never discount is the parasocial aspect. The fact that WoW is in many ways an engine for socialization. It kind of became that by accident, um, mostly because like it was a popular MMO, and then through being a popular MMO, it brought together a lot of people. And this was, you know, also around the same time when things like Vent and Teamspeak were starting to become more commonly mm. used. And so you weren't just like logging in and seeing a character's name and seeing them type stuff in chat like you would in say EverQuest or. Um, Dark Age of Camelot or, you know, some of these older MMOs, you're actually like talking to people and also sort of the, the since raiding was far more accessible, like in EverQuest, raiding guilds were basically people with no lives you because you couldn't do it 
otherwise. Um, whereas in WoW, raiding was far more was far more accessible, especially as expansions went on, because they started like you know breaking down raiding into tiers. Um, initial like raid dungeons were usually much easier so like in you know wrath of the lich king they essentially like brought back mm -hmm. next ramus so most people already knew how to do it um it was just like tuned slightly differently and so as a result you have people you know getting in a rhythm of meeting regularly because you know wow uh, wow raids have weekly resets and so you know they're getting mm -hmm. together at the same time to and they have like scheduled social interactions and so that parasocial aspect has a real pull on people because when you come back and or like you see people from your guild or you have that actual like meaningful human interaction when you hear someone's voice or you have that yeah. sort of like regularly uh, scheduled interaction like that's a big part of it because i'm i mean i'm gonna bag wow a little bit even in its current iteration i think it's it's not a great game like as as a as a, as a game that you experience through its gameplay like if you separate out the like the, all those parasocial aspects, it's a middling game, I think, especially by comparison with modern MMOs, which have just far superior gameplay. I'm I'm gonna say that right now. That's my lay opinion. No, for sure. Yeah, but the thing is also like WoW has been also been in constant decline. Like wow sort of figures prominently in people's imaginations because like as you were saying earlier like it gets you know blizzard gets a lot of press blizzard is a very prestigious company and wow has sort of been around for a long time like even lay people know what it is people who've never played the game before have some vague sense of what it is but it's not a very popular game anymore especially when you compare it with other mm even other mmos like it's just not um no, I think that that actually brings up a really interesting point because I've been out of, say, I'll call it the MMO playing market or something weird like that. Because I used to play every MMO I could get my hands on. Um, like, speaking of MMOs, I actually, the really the reason why I got off of WoW was probably because I played Star Wars The Old Republic uh, ever since it came out, like, in 2012. Uh, and then I lost my account. Thanks, guys. Um, and I, I lost my Splatorsky, so I can never get in. That being said... Um, I've been off of the MMO playing field for so long that I, what came up uh, in a dev circle the other day was that there's this MMO called Black Desert Online yeah. that passed the 1 billion sales mark, mm -hmm. which just completely blew my mind because I'd never heard of it until like, I guess a month ago or something when we were talking about it. And so now I'm like, I have to play Black Desert Online. I have to play, which is not free, but I have to play Genshin Impact, which is free and has been yeah. described as Breath of the Waifus. So I'm very excited yeah. about Breath of the Waifus. It basically is. Um, yeah. <laughs> so good. I'm going to quote that and put it on a t-shirt. Breath <laughs> of the Waifus. Genshin Impact. Um, <laughs> it's going to be great. And uh, no, but so those, those, those two that I really need to play. And when you look at those types of game mechanics and what's really compelling about them, it is, I would say, as a single player, more compelling, right, than World of Warcraft. Yeah. Now, what's funny is that when I actually played WoW and Burning Crusade, I had a couple of friends that played it, but I got them into it. I actually played alone. I played World of Warcraft mainly and primarily alone for like, like years. I won't say how many years, but I'll just say years. <laughs> some and amount of time. When I, some amount of time. <laughs> then when I got back into WoW, while I have friends that work at Blizzard and I have friends that like had a WoW themed wedding, like I didn't even tell them I was on retail yet because I was like, I really just want to play WoW by myself. And I get that we say WoW isn't say, or you know, you say, hey, WoW isn't a great game when you compare it to all these other factors. For me, I'm actually still trying to figure out why do I like playing WoW alone when I could be playing another MMO that has less parasocial right, interactions also alone? Yeah. Is it just because WoW is familiar? Because that's totally valid. No, like, I don't. Wow I don't, was familiar, and that's why I enjoy it. I just I, I don't I, think it is that that Wow was familiar. One, um, so the major improvement post Cataclysm is that they really improved how leveling works, like the leveling experience in Wow, and they started to do this in Wrath of the Lich King. And they were sort of laying the foundations for it, but it was really Cataclysm that sort of made the whole leveling experience far more cohesive, and so you could have individual gameplay that was far less taxing and you could break up into much more manageable chunks 
Mm -hmm. There was a lot less grinding. You didn't just have to like constantly pull them. It's not like you didn't have quests where like somebody was sending you out in the wilderness to collect, you know, 40 bear butts, but only like one in every 10 bears has a butt for some reason and so you you're you're killing like 400 of the same mob for this quest actually if you haven't and if you haven't picked up wow actually recently not only have they completely made leveling um say incredibly easy to manage like leveling is almost just inherent now because there are so many levels in the experience that like every bear has a butt and so you only need to get 10 bears because each bear has a butt yeah that's what i was trying to say yeah yeah right yeah. Um, have you played recently? Like, well, like I said, I played, I played, I played Legion. Um, and when I played Legion, so I both had my, um, what did I play in Legion? I played mostly my Paladin in Legion. But the other thing that I did, in fact, the more, the reason why I stuck with it for a little while is because I leveled a Goblin Warrior. And I, I, I don't get it. Like people, cr- people, especially in WoW, like WoW players crap on Goblins and the whole like Goblin thing. I thought the goblin leveling experience was delightful. I thought it was fantastic. I loved the fact that it leaned into sort of like the cartoonishness of of the game, because in many ways, that's what I think the game does better. When the game is serious, I actually find it to be kind of corny and not really that interesting. But when the game is really sort of like tongue in cheek and, you know, it has all the like the weird, stupid puns and wordplay or like there's, you know, clearly like oblique references to popular media that's when i think it's at its at its best and the goblin yeah. like especially like leveling up to how far did i get i think i got to 35 when i stopped playing um that whole experience was just delightful i loved it i, I thought it was great i, I yeah. loved i love the goblin starting zones and you're right it was it was far more cohesive like you very clearly went from A to B to C. But the problem that I have with the leveling experience in WoW is that it doesn't teach you how to play the game. In other words, what I mean by that is that there is a way that you're, like with each class and with each spec, there is a particular way you are almost certainly going to have to play it when you do reach max level and the game doesn't really teach you how to do that. Yeah, okay. So that actually goes into something that's like really interesting to me as a developer is when you look at single player design and you look at teaching a person how to play their class, because it is not in an, in an, in like an MP setting, you can easily and organically teach them as they're leveling. Like these are the skills that you'll need to use and here is how you will play and here is how that this experience is going to work for you. But when you're in a multiplayer setting, suddenly like all the rules are off. And I think that's exactly what you're hitting on is that now when you're playing an MMO, how you're going to need to play this class for like a group setting, depending on how you want to do it. Yeah. Um, like it doesn't exist. And is it because it's a multiplayer experience? And so I would no. like to know, does Final Fantasy 14 like do this in a way that actually teaches you how you're going to play that class? Yes. And also, is it with the pre- like presumption that you're going to be playing it within a party? Yeah. And does that differ for then how they would tell you to play that solo? So the answer is yes, yes, and mostly. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the, the first one, does it does it te- does Final Fantasy XIV teach you how to play your particular class? The answer is yes. And I think in particular, like, even though I have frustrations about how healing works in the game, um, healing is very non, it's not intuitive. And also it's not really something you can do as, like when you're playing a DPS spec, you know, doing damage to creatures is fundamentally the same when you're doing it just by yourself as when you're doing it in a dungeon. Um, But the problem is there's not really an aspect of healing in the sort of like standard MMO, like doing quests to grind thing that like you can really be taught through the gameplay mechanics. So this is where I think actually having the main storyline so in many ways, there are, there are like two main storylines. There's the main storyline for the game, sort of like what is happening in the world and how you progress from a nobody into like the champion of everything. But then there is also a storyline for your class. So when you're, so you start out as a conjurer and like, so every five levels, there is like a major quest series that you have to do in order to gain abilities. Like in order to gain your, I don't really agree with this as a design decision, but I can understand why they do it. Because part 
of what is involved in each of those quests is essentially teaching you how to use those abilities. And I think the game could do more of this, but there are instances where the scenarios that are set up for you do actually require you to heal. They require you to heal NPCs that are tanking on your behalf or doing damage on your behalf. There's one where like, you actually have to mix healing with doing damage where there's a scenario where you're helping these two other white mages who are trying to like purge this evilness from a big tree. And so part of that is you have to help heal the tree to keep it alive, even as like other things in the forest are coming to attack it. So you have to kill the things that are attacking it and heal the tree and help out the other two who are trying to purge the tree so that they don't get killed. And so it teaches you a certain degree of situational awareness and what you have to do as a healer in order to be successful. I don't think it does enough of this. But the fact that it does it at all, I found to be kind of remarkable because honestly, I've never played an MMO where it actually like puts you in a scenario where you have to figure out how to do something that is that fundamental to your class. Um, I wish dungeons were more forgiving. I wish there was less of like essentially sticking like one new person with three people who are power leveling because it's like I said, it, especially with a, as unforgiving as healing is to put somebody who is totally new into that situation with only sort of like the basic healing instruction that they've gotten through these quests, it's not enough. But like I said, the fact that it does it at all is nice. And also because you have to do that for your character as well as for the main storyline, it gives you this sort of sense of character progression that is actually independent of the main storyline. So the main storyline quests, you know, they move you through all the cool stuff and you find out what the world is. But the character quests are generally give you much better gear. In fact, the gear that you get from the level 50 white mage quest you keep for a very long time. It also looks really cool. It looks like the classic like Final Fantasy white mage outfit. It's yeah. kind of awesome. Um, <clears throat> but in addition to that, it gives you a sense of like your character has many places in the world. And so it gives you the sense of like, I actually find it kind of remarkable that an MMO can do this or any game can do this where it's sort of like, it shows you how open the world is, not just in terms of like its size and its environments, because that's usually what people mean when they say like an open world game. Yep. They're talking about like the freedom, they're talking essentially about like a sandbox situation of freedom of movement. But this actually shows you how the world is open in a social sense, because it shows you how your character actually has different ways to relate to the world around you into the context in which you're playing. And I now I'm adding Final Fantasy 14 to my list. So something that like I'm really excited about when we talk about MMO and specifically like multiplayer open world design is what you're talking on is that the relatability to the environment around you and your characterization, your say personification of the avatar, right? Or the character that you're playing is how much do you relate to them by how much can they relate to the world around them? How much of say the world do you have control over? Because usually, right, in MMOs, you don't really have over control of anything. You kind of accept quests, you can turn in quests, you can get gear, you can dismantle your gear or sell your gear, um, and you can kill things, right? Like that's the extent of your interactions. Usually, yeah. And usually. And so to hear that like you have, but, right, you can accept quests. And so what Final Fantasy XIV sounds like it's doing is that at the very heart of the, design, say design floor table or design discussions, they were like, this is going to be an unforgiving, really hard experience where teamwork is going to be absolutely essential. Yeah. So in order to do that, they had to create, right? There's, the, there's going to be the main storyline quest. It's almost like they fiated it. They kind of had to create a way for you to understand how to use those mechanics within this, right? Teamwork is going to be absolutely essential kind of methodology, right? Yep. It's not a celebration of power or a celebration of how cool you are. It is no, you are struggling and fighting for your life. It's that struggle, yeah. right? And so with that theme of struggle, they're like, well, now you have to do the character class. You know, I guess have to, right? You pretty but much have I, to because- because. But you pretty much have to. Yeah. <laughs> there are certain abilities and, that are locked under um, class quests. Yeah. And, and you and have so that to- even Reen, sorry. And you have to do them in order. Like, so it, it's not like, so like if there is an ability that's locked behind, say like the level 45 class quest, 
you have to do all the ones previous to it. You can't do it no, like that, independently. Yeah, because like, when I look at Final Fantasy fourteen, a reason why I haven't played it is because of the struggle. And I don't like playing games that require me to struggle. Like I struggle every day in my life. Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe when I uh, in a in a more secure like place, I'm not just moving every like nine months and I like and like maybe settle down a little bit, I'll I'll struggle in my Final Fantasy fourteen, right? Yeah. Um, but like when I look at this game and I like understand your experience about it. There's something that's really fascinating about it because it reminds me of World of Warcraft Classic because it's that struggle, right? Where teamwork is absolutely essential. It's that struggle where you have to find your role. And what WoW's design did was said, we have the internet and we're just gonna use it to our advantage. We're not gonna tell people what the game is about because the people, right, are going to figure it out just like they did in EverQuest and just like they did in Ultima. Like they're going to figure it out because they have the internet. They'll go to forums and they talk. Right. And so Blizzard just had amazing community support. They're like, we'll just create this community around it. Yeah. And then it kind of created this like knowledge bank. Right. Yes. Versus now Final Fantasy 14 coming a lot later was like, look, the Internet is great and all, but the Internet's huge. There's just way too much information on the Internet. Yeah. Right. And not necessarily that, but also like we need a way to show in the game that struggle and like teamwork, because I don't think struggle is the say methodology of world of warcraft i don't think like if anything it wasn't that it was please come and play with your friends and have fun yeah i don't think i don't think they had i don't think there was an ideology underlying it initially yeah. at least Especially yeah since... i don't think there was there probably was but i mean come play with your friends have fun is an ideology right because, yeah because i don't because i think if they had like some like clear like parasocial design goals in mind they wouldn't have allowed the like rampant toxicity that existed in like early wow and its various expansions mm -hmm. because right there i mean because the thing is at the same time as it's great to say like okay the information's out there we expect you to sort of go and figure it out and that's part of the beauty of playing the game and it is like learning about sort of like how to optimize your character in ways outside of the game you're right actually i liked it i did like it the problem with that is that because all of that got put on to sort of the parasocial realm it meant that very quickly it evolved into like power gaming and various like enforced metagaming rules yeah where like, absolutely if you if you wanted to participate in particular forms of content and you played a particular class you were essentially compelled by the people you played with to play that class in a particular way and this no, was, absolutely and this was definitely no, I, you know, I just want to say, like, I was in a raid once. I played Molten Core once in my whole life, and it was this, oh, it was this year, February 2020, before the COVID apocalypse. And I hated every minute of it. Like, I was thrust into a Discord server with, like, 40 other people, but there was only, like, maybe 25 or 30 or something. I am did not realize that like there was etiquette to when you were supposed to log on and when you were supposed to be in the raid. Like I didn't know anything about global buffs or potions or whatever I needed to get. Yep. Like, people just assumed a lot, especially for like a priest. And then when I didn't do stuff, people were like trying to find metrics on like how often was I dispelling or like how well were my heals and shit. And then to top it all off, I actually got two pieces of gear from the raid and then just like left that discord server and never looked back. <laughs> so no regrets. Um, but that, like all, all of that being said, like, it was just really like hard for me because it was all of those parasocial mechanics. Yeah. And when you look at like Blizzard's like early inception and they didn't really have that kind of culture and you could uh, uh, contrast it to Final Fantasy 14, which did have a really clear vision, right? This actually goes all the way back into what we were talking about with company culture, because games at first of their inceptions, or come like play this game come have fun with your friends or please play our game it's a game games are fun we promise it's fun dear lord please be fun we had to hand print a hundred copies of these in our local like retailer by ourselves because we don't know how to outsource publishing right like that's what it was but now games especially at this large scale have to have a clear solid vision and people have to believe in this vision. They have to buy the vision that shared struggle is a really important concept for your game to be about, which means that all of the fun and mechanics have to talk about how we become better people because we have a shared struggle. Yeah. 
and we yeah. can overcome things together. But if your company and the people working on something that has a vision of we with a shared struggle are better for overcoming things together, if the people don't believe that, then suddenly there's this disconnect and that instant creative friction with I am creating something I don't yeah. believe in. And so now we look at, say, Blizzard's like future games, or we could look at any other company's future games and say, what are those games about? You can actually kind of see the schism and why that company there has to do like layoffs or why the game doesn't perform to, say, the expectations of the consumer. Or maybe why the marketing falls short of that game where you're like, wow, that's not the game that I expected. It's yeah. because the culture and the, of the people making the game are going to influence the game more than the culture of the company but a company is a body of people. And when people leave the company, they take that culture with them, whether it's good or bad, right? Yeah. And so now in our like modern era of gaming, I really see this trend, not just towards making games that are fun and exciting to play, though I do think that will still exist, but you're gonna see a lot of more developers and a lot of more of these big names create games and game companies surrounding those types of values that are going to bring people together that are about those types of creative vision because that's what's yeah. really important in these games yeah i should note that um what i was describing as parasocial i should probably just describe as social mm -hmm. it's kind of well because it's kind of complicated i, I liked your word parasocial i mean well, because, it made it sound because, really cool well because parasocial like metaphysics parasocial usually refers to sort of like an imagined relationship between somebody who's like in an audience and like something that is like they're connected to it's essentially like a one-way thing where you have like a media figure or like a media environment or like you know you imagine your relationship to say a character in a video game or to like a pop star or something like that but there's no actual relationship there um, and so there, there are parasocial aspects of like how this works in video games, especially since like, you know, certain people have, particularly in MMOs or certain like guilds that are prominent or like there are particular like streamers who are really prominent and you can have like a parasocial relationship with them. But there's also just an ordinary social relationship. But the problem is like the social relationship that you have with say like your guild mates or just like randos you meet in like through the dungeon finder oftentimes reflects the way you and other people have those other parasocial relationships. So I, 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 just... I, I that's exactly why I thought your term was actually fine. So for me as someone who this actually also came up uh, in a discussion last week. Um, this is really interesting how this just happens to be flowing. <laughs> um, but this also came up in discussion last week, which was how people on Zoom sometimes feel like they haven't met any of their coworkers for people that are being hired during this process because they've only been on Zoom. For me, I was on the internet actually over half my life now, which is exciting to say. Yeah. Um, but for over half my life, I spent on the internet meeting people. And for me, some of my best friends that I, I met online before I actually ever met in person. Yeah. To me, digitally meeting something or having a digital social relationship is just as valid, if not in some cases more valid yeah. than having ever met that person in reality. And what's interesting to me is that it is and does start as, I think, a parasocial relationship. Especially when you look at, say, Twitter. Like you meet someone on yeah. Twitter, okay, whether yeah, or not yeah. they have a check mark, right? Like you meet someone right, on Twitter yeah. and you're like, wow, I love what you say, et cetera. And then you slowly begin to like cultivate what could or could not be a relationship, right? Like yeah. there's this person out there that they don't know who you are, but then something, maybe they see you and also now are parasocially interacting with you as someone they're like, oh, you're really cool. Suddenly you have these two media figures talking until eventually like there's a line or I don't even want to call it a line. It's really more of a spectrum where something, yeah. it just blends. And yeah. now it's a social relationship where you and this other person who have only ever communicated, say, via tweets or Twitter are now actually in a like committed, right? Social friendship, right? Yep. Or even acquaintanceship, right? Yeah, parasocial almost doesn't make sense in those. It's one of the reasons why I sort of, after the fact, I was like, is this really describing what I think it's describing? Is because, yeah, there, there's, there isn't a line anymore because, you know, especially when you're talking about like popular media figures, there used to be a fairly hard distance like a social distance between you know the audience or fans or like fan culture and the people themselves now especially when you're talking about like 
people who have become famous in say like like twitch streamers is a really good example of mm -hmm. this where like you actually like there is no clear dividing line you can start as a rando who admires someone and you can actually develop either you know a decent or a weird or a good or a toxic or any kind of relationship with that individual because the communication barrier isn't there as much yep i think absolutely and so like hell i'll even use myself as an example is that because of my work on my current right project i got a lot of new followers on twitter and i also got followers on instagram um for me, I, I treat everybody as a, as a human and I'm pretty good about seeing like, is this person private messaging me like something that looks very suspicious, I'm gonna block them. Or is this person just going like, hey, I saw your story and I really love the fact that you worked on this game that I enjoy. Um, so for me, when I get a message like that, I'm like, thank you. That's, that's just all I say, right? And yeah. some of these people are like, that's it. Like, they're like, oh man, like, thank you. But some of them are like, thank you so much for responding, right? Like you can tell that they're like, wow, like you, they want to enter that. They, they have looked at me as a parasocial relationship. Like they've looked at me as some high figure. I only have like 600 followers on Instagram, guys. <laughs> like I'm not big, yeah. um, it's, right? It's not like I'm secretly like in the 24Ks or whatever, right? I'm only got like 600 people. And this is one of those people that's just like, thank you so much for responding. I can't believe it. Like, and then they just gush more about it, right? Like they're getting these little fan DMs. And like yeah. a lot of them are really nice. And so I like screenshot them and I share them to my coworkers to be like, hey guys, like you're doing a good job. This is great. Keep it up. Because it's not just all me, right? Yeah. But even me, right? In that parasocial relationship, like you could say looking across the, the way to someone that's just like, I love this. In another phrase, someone like really liked one of my coffee posts and then suddenly was is now I learned is located in the Bay Area and was like, hey, here's actually where you need to go here. Oh, by the way, this is where you should get your groceries because of COVID. Like this is where like there won't be any lines. Yeah. And now it's become some, I wouldn't say it's definitely not parasocial anymore, right? It's not just someone like, oh, this person is admiring my work. It's now like, hey, I need to help this person out because we have a shared experience of our location. Well, it's, it's weird because it's sort of, it, it almost is the case that proves the non-distinction because yep. it, the, so when people describe something as parasocial, oftentimes they're trying to enforce a distinction and that distinction may be real. There may be real like communicative and social distance between people. And when I say social distance, I'm not talking about the, you have to stand six feet apart from somebody. I mean, there's actually yeah. like in terms the digital of digital distance, yeah, your, your, your social circles don't really overlap. That's what I mean, um, but that there are, there's a, there's a huge swath of interactions, particularly online, that where that terminology just doesn't make sense. And I think that's where yeah. I think that's what we're trying to get at is this this idea that like in many ways the sort of the world in which and, and a lot of people enter into that sort of quasi I guess maybe it's better to say quasi social. Well, no, because I like is, that. I like it, that term is, a lot, but it's weird. But the thing is, it is just social. Like, because the thing is, it, it is, it's it just is a... social. At, at the end of the day, like when you look at these things called social media, yeah, like it, it's called social media because it is social media. Like, you cannot have a say an insta. Let me rephrase this. You can have an Instagram profile that is just parasocial, right? You're a really well-known celebrity, or you're a really well-known business, a brand, a corporate entity, yeah, and you're parasocial, yeah. Um, Right, Old Navy has one point like six million followers on Instagram, and I don't know who needs to be marketed to to where they feel like they need to follow Old Navy, but they do, right? And that is a parasocial relationship. Old Navy is not going to strike up a really cute conversation. No. But I will actually then contrast this to a lot of the Starbucks Instagram accounts um, because I do follow the Starbucks Instagram accounts because I'm someone that needs to be marketed to more by Starbucks. Because you are an addict, apparently. because you are a genuine addict. I am an addict. Yes, <laughs> I am an addict. And um, But they also post really nice photos and I wanted like, it's my inspiration. And one of them on there, they are run by humans, right? They're run by social yeah. media managers, right? And so I posted or reposted something that one of them did and they were like hey we'd love for you to come visit the store wow that is an instant right social kind of validation of my existence as a human being <laughs> on this note um <laughs> right but someone could see it like that yeah and that's where i think this parasocial social kind of divide is super super breaking down as we get into more of the online presence of these like shared world experiences because we have that shared world experience on the internet so like I, I guess in a way, like you saying parasocial 
was accurate for like, say the old beginning of the podcast where we were looking at it, like in the yeah. old methodology of online well, what interactions. I was what I was trying to now think now it's, it's social. Yeah. What I was trying to think about was this, this type of sociality that video games facilitate. Um, and it involved, I mean, it's similar to what you see in other forms of media, but also like, um, Social media is weird, especially when you're talking about Twitter, because Twitter, you're you're essentially broadcasting. Like, you can like have interactions that feel much more like a kind of like intimate like group relationship, or I'll say a larger group relationship. Sorry, I'm trying not to pick at my various rashes and lesions, which is not fun. Um, Okay. Sorry, what was I saying? <laughs> what was I saying? No, um, so, but for like one of the things that I think a game like WoW did in a way that other MMOs did not, and so this is what it, this is one of its like sort of its accidental genius is that it facilitated a kind of sociality that actively breaks down that sort of para quasi social like like all of those ways in which we try to make distinctions between social relationships like it actively just sort of made cause that to deteriorate I definitely agree yeah. with that yeah because when you look at retail wow and you look at say wow now and you want to like level up your tank female pandaren drunken master um you don't have to play with anybody and the social relationship between you and anybody else on that server, like you're basically all power leveling at that point. You don't need to talk to anybody. You don't need to wait around for kills to respawn and have that kind of unspoken of like, Hey, I know you just killed that guy. Can I, can I kill the next one? Cause like these werewolves yeah. are not going to respawn in time for me to yeah. kill them. And I think that there's this unspoken, it becomes this unspoken societal norm of the environment that creates that sort of social, right, necess necessitation for social activity. Versus like now in retail, you don't actually have that, you don't need it, but it's made the game a lot more successful, like, and or not successful, but accessible. Excuse accessible, me. yeah. Accessible. Yeah. Um, it's made it a lot faster. You can like get to the end game, which then requires you, but conversely, you aren't ever needed to learn yeah. how to create like those in-game right roles for yourself you never need to do it versus in classic if you take the eight days and you run every single dungeon kind of on route you start to learn what you need to do in the dungeon mentality yeah Actually, and, a, as a, and, like, it, and also in a more forgiving environment like there yeah so what what i was talking about earlier with like the way i feel final fantasy 14 kind of teaches you how to how to play your role um, there is, I think, one exception to WoW's general not t tendency not to do this, and that's the and that's in Westfall, where and Westfall is a really really brilliantly designed zone. It's probably one of only a handful of brilliantly designed hate, zones in the game. I hate Westfall, but I I'm gonna let make you have I'm gonna it. make the argument. So the reason why it's brilliantly designed is because like there there's a lot of stuff going on there. It has a good density of quests. Um, it's not friggin' huge like many WoW zones That's are. That's very true. It's not the um, barons. Like, yeah, or barons or like Teneris or um, Silithus, like where you feel like you're just... All I'm running. hearing are all of the horde areas are so <laughs> flat and barren. <laughs> they really are. Well, no, but the thing is like, well, but take a zone like, not, it's not even a zone, but like um, Shimmering Flats, which is part of... Uh, all of the horde areas are flat and barren. No, but Shimmering <laughs> Flats is a really well-designed zone because it has a theme. It has the whole like race. Course. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It has yeah, the yeah. whole race course, and it's it has a fairly high density of quests. I actually, I actually agree with the whole Westfall argument that I think you might be making because I remember playing Westfall. I remember enjoying Westfall, but I remember I was there too long, and that is why. I yeah, didn't like it. but the thing is, what you do, but all, but the quests that you do in Westfall, they guide you towards the major dungeon in that zone and it's not just mm -hmm. like the defias quest line there's also like defias related stuff that you do as like side quests and sort of like the game is telling you the story of what's going on in that zone and then in the process of telling you that story and also it has quests that are unlike a lot of early other starter quests in other zones where like you have to do escort missions you have to like find couriers there's like more interesting types of things that you have to do and those all contribute to going into this dungeon the dead mines and like f you know and it's not a particularly hard dungeon it's not actually really. a hard dungeon either but they did completely like redo it 
in retail that's now true, yeah. from classic it's, it's different now. because I played it in Burning Crusade or I played it back in the day when I was Alliance in World of Warcraft. And I remember really enjoying Dead Mines. And then I got onto retail to show it to somebody that was just getting into retail with me. And it was so different that like, I completely bombed the whole thing. I was just like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. It is just confusing. It looked it's so confusing. It was like aesthetically different. Yeah. Um, but that being said, yeah, like Westfall also ended up having that one quest with, um, what was it? It had the quest where like you had to, it was like a mystery. You had to figure out who murdered someone and yeah. it was by going into the cornfield and yep. discussing with like ghost children or something. Yep. And then like what immediately follows Westfall is Duskwood, which is also a really, it's not oh, as- Oh, Duskwood I, is amazing. I don't think it's as well designed because it does have a lot of the runniness that I don't particularly enjoy. Like one of the things that really is annoying about WoW is how like all quest givers tend, not universally, but they tend to be located in exactly one spot. And then- but then they have quests for literally the entire zone. And so like some of your requests are literally going to be on the other side of the zone. You run back, get the next in the sequence. Uh, and then there's this sort of like- Yeah, so there's like, that's why like the, the guides were really helpful. But so the reason why I think Duskwell, so our Duskwood suffers where Westfall is exciting is that Westfall was allowed to do a correct hub level design that then facilitated you to kind of bottleneck into the dead mines. Yeah. Because you can see the dead mines is actually at the bottom of the map. Versus when you look at Westfall, it actually has like a hub and spokes where you actually can go all around and most of your quest givers yeah, are in the center. Exactly. And that was, a it was allowed to do that, allowed I'm going to say in production terms, uh, <laughs> because it's kind of off to the side, there's nothing really there. And like, there's just coast and then it has these two other areas in the river. So it truly is an island of beauty, right? But then when you come to Duskwood, you actually have to run through Duskwood to get from like what the, um, like Burning Steps, but also um, Stranglethorn Vale, you have to run through Duskwood to get yeah. like four territories, right? Yeah. So it's not actually, even though when you look at the map, you can see where potentially they wanted to do that hub's design where they've placed the center, like center town. Yeah. Actually, you, have, you see that they had to kind of push it up, right? Well, In level design terms, you can see they had to shove it because they have like the two <laughs> villages yeah. Yeah. Where as we do our little things. So they have two villages, but you can see they kind of had to shove things around a bit. So At least I can kind of, I feel like I see it because they had to create that through line, not for the alliance players. Oh, but for okay. The I see what you're players. saying. So because, so, so, the, so I'll, I'll, I'll just, for those of you who haven't played WoW, I'll sort of describe how Duskwood is laid out. Duskwood essentially has four, I, I would say like five parts. So that so you, yep. you have you have a you have a road that runs east west through like the like two thirds so if if you think of like sort of an oval on its side and sort of a rectangular oval like in the dead center of that oval is this huge unused part for most of the the early part of of the game because it's essentially like a giant portal for like a raid with green green dragons and it was patched in later in the game so then on the right hand like upper third you have um, the town, the actual town where you know all your quest givers are and where the human people are, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the left-hand side, you have where most of the actual mobs that you're going to have to fight are. And then, so then below that left-hand third, there's an, there are areas with worgen and spiders and various other creepy people. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom right-hand side, there are like skeletons and so forth. And so the thing, but the thing is, because you have this giant unused area in the dead center it means that you're constantly ping-ponging back and forth from one side to the other whereas what lauren is saying is that if like that zone had been designed well for questing you would have put the town where that is so that way you can sort of radiate out into other directions and it's more centrally located however if i'm understanding what you're saying correctly they couldn't do that precisely because of the way the zones connect to each other. And since, the, yes. and since you like going through Duskwood is a primary like horde path to get from Stranglethorn Vale into Alliance territory, like they needed to shunt that off. They needed to shunt the town off to one side because you didn't want to literally have like horde constantly ruining the Alliance leveling experience, which they absolutely. kind of did, so, which they did anyway. So no, absolutely. But what actually you actually can look at is that, I would like to argue that the portal was actually closer to that higher level area, Deadwind Pass, over on the left, because it is surrounded by all of those mountains. 
And I would like to say that the town was in the center, but precisely because they had Horde players running through that area, the village was not protected because of the Horde. And also, right, because the Horde players themselves conversely didn't like being camped by Alliance, they ended up having to change that level entirely. So while it was actually set up quite like Elwyn and Westfall, and Duskwood was actually set up with that more of a hub radiating design out into the questing zone areas that they had to actually make that swap, which is why Duskwood, while it has an incredible story, actually feels really weird, right? And it doesn't actually feel correct because doesn't it look, if you look at Twilight Grove yeah. on the map, which is in the center, doesn't it look like it would just fit perfectly in with those mountains? Like why would they put mountains in the middle of the map there? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, they put so, it there because they have to block it off. <laughs> they have to block it off. Yeah. But like you already have mountain range in your environment over here. Yeah. There is no need for you to change the environment yeah. of this area. Anyway, so yeah, that's you're, you're the right. argument it, that I would like to make. You're right. It very easily could have been in the sort of the upper right hand side of the area. It could have been further south. It could have been like um, in the bottom right hand side where Tranquil Garden Cemetery is like that's a more logical location for a mountainous yeah, I, thing to be. Yep. And I absolutely 100% think that it was because of playtests and or you could even say paper playtests where they just had people mimic running around the world where they ended up having to move. Uh, the town is now called Darkshire. That's on the right side yeah, um, or the east side of the map. Yeah, And then Twilight Grove is that raid area we were talking about. I yeah. 100% 99% because I mean you can never be 100% sure in games but I definitely think that one of the reasons why this map design ended up the way it did was because it wasn't this way to begin with okay um, and then they moved it because of right wanting to protect the village and stuff. yeah because I'm thinking back so a lot of the zones especially in the human side of the equation like a lot of zones that are in World of Warcraft like are taken from Warcraft 3 Yes. And I don't think there actually is a Warcraft 3 like correspondent to um, Duskwood. Maybe there was, I and I just don't remember. Honestly, I, I your guess is as good as mine. I don't quite remember. I love Duskwood despite all of the ping ponging because it really was, for me, coming out of Westfall and Elwind where I was like, okay, Westfall's cool and all. But Duskwood's like kind of gothic, like mystery and also like horror kind of aspect to it. I just yeah. really liked the, the super stark contrast from the other areas. Well, so I mean, it's I the, loved it. the other major advantage. I mean, the, the one of the primary advantages that Duskwood had is, well, one, there's a fairly natural progression, like from Elwood, for, Elwyn Forest to Westfall, but then also like Red Ridge is on the other side of Elwyn. So you can sort of go there first if you want. But also, like, just there are a lot of quests in Duskwood. Like, there are a lot of things to do. And what sort of causes WoW to drag, what caused vanilla WoW to drag, particularly, like, post-40, was that you had zones that were, like, twice the size of the starting zones and had fewer quests. Mm -hmm. And it was also because, though, they actually had elite quests, which gave you double the bonus. Yeah. So you were supposed to be able to party up with like say random people and create this pickup group and then go into a, an elite area and then get say double the amount right for yeah. say fewer the quest givers and so while it looks say good on paper like that paper balancing didn't really work out in play especially because since the areas were bigger there was a less likelihood of you actually meeting someone to even pick up and by the time yeah. that you had people flying from a city in if you were there already like they already had had their group together and that right there and that what you just said about the fact that like in these upper levels you had you were far less likely to like run into people who could help you like that's why i think okay i'm gonna stop the screen share for a second that's why i think that blizzard didn't actually have the social aspects of the game really in mind at the in the design stages because if they had had that in mind, they would have thought about things, you know, basically unpopulated zones or giant zones, or, I mean, it's also entirely possible that a lot of the later zones are, aren't as complete simply because they're just unfinished. Like they're as complete as they needed to be to ship. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. But what's also interesting is that when you look at a thing like Legion, like Legion is the ultimate, right? How then spokes kind of area where it is just an end, an end game, I'll put end game in scare quotes because it's no longer end game. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a nice scare quotes end game area where you have like this major city in the center, 
it will center center ish enough and then you're able to kind of go off into these other regions but you can also look at how they didn't have the social aspect in say the world or the environment or level design because the feature that actually allowed you to meet people faster was a systemic feature it was a button dungeon finder find a dungeon find a people solved problem like yeah. it was a very systemic and I'll call it rational design sort of like philosophy. Now it's not to nix the dungeon finder because I actually quite like dungeon finding as a, as a feature, but like the, if they had had encountering social like relationships and social people through the world, yeah. then they would have solved the problem through the world design. But because yeah. they didn't have that at the onset, like you said, they ended up implementing Dungeon Finder because they're like, the problem is people can't find people to dungeon with. Not yeah. the fact that the space was too large. It's they just read the problem like on paper. So they solved it on paper. Yeah, well, they, the problem is like, so it's almost like they were constantly trying to hot fix social problems in the game. Um, mm -hmm. I, th I still think to this day, Blizzard just does not have, I mean, maybe I'm going on a limb here. Maybe they actually do understand this and just don't know how to, or like haven't implemented it well, but they've never, to my mind, they've never really had a good understanding of how the social aspects of the games can be engineered. Like they're really glad that it happens and they're really, they're willing to sort of create systems after the fact that like help people along like you know dungeon finder but the thing is also dungeon finder was itself kind of a quick fix to a problem because mm -hmm. it doesn't actually encourage all that much social interaction it's it's yeah. sort of so it's sort of, I, it's sort of a it, salad it, no, it, yeah no no, no no it completely actually nixes the social interaction right yeah. just like in retail wow where you don't need to have social interaction anymore if you go into a dungeon and you're a solo player i think you automatically enter the dungeon finder system at least that's, I think that's how it happened for me. And then they just meet you with a, with a party automatically. And then you never even have to engage with any sort of social, say, norms that were nope. in the original WoW. Yeah. Now, I don't want to speak to anything that Modern Blizzard is doing, one, because I do have friends that work there and I would never want to say anything no. that they may or like they, they could no, be potentially working on just in supposition, even though I haven't like opinion. talked to them. 100% yeah. my opinion. No, this absolutely. The, so yeah. one, yeah, 100, like eh, not 100% my opinion um, because like, I don't, I kind of believe this, but I also am, am a realist, but I do think that Blizzard is taking approaches into figuring out how to engineer better social behavior. And I say this because of the program of Overwatch and Overwatch instituted game mechanics specifically to award basically team leaders, team players, and like most valuable play and celebrating teamwork and positive behavior. Right. Yeah. And so while I do think that World of Warcraft and, you know, even Starcraft don't necessarily have those mechanics, Overwatch, one of their newer titles, does have game mechanics that are about influencing and promoting positive social behavior. So yeah. I do think that future things, maybe like Shadowlands will have it, um, but I'm not, I mean, I can't actually speak to whether it will or it won't, um, but I do think that they're trying to figure out what engineers it. But as a game developer, I would like to say, wow, like engineering social behavior, like what is that even? Like that is a whole other topic. That's like the Zuckerberg yeah. topic. Yeah, it, 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 also, it also sort of like as as that's as, not really a game design -y. <laughs> As a as a as a Marxist, that also takes me into very queasy territory because no, his, yeah, I am his, the history the history of social of social engineering in communist countries is um. Not, not a good one <laughs> it's, it's kind of yeah a bad i one. am yeah i so i don't i don't want us to get into a discussion about that and i don't think we were trying to either i just nope. wanted to completely state it out there on the podcast for all the listeners out there is that we were not trying to get into a discussion about that no. but many of you may have picked up on the <laughs> certain cues of things that we could have said that uh but that is not what we were trying to do it was just looking at how social mechanics interact within the game space in a completely virtual non-real world <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening to this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. You can rate and review us on iTunes since it really helps with getting the pod out to more people. Or just spread the word the old-fashioned way uh, by carrier pigeon or on the lecture circuit, I guess. You can follow Lauren on Twitter at the Lauren Ash. That's T-H-E-L-A-U-R-Y-N-A-S-H. 
or you can follow me um, at U A H S E N A. Sorry, U A H S E N A A. And you can follow the podcast at Fudidashi Pod. So that's F U R I D A S H I P O D. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Until then, try not to let the apocalypse get you down. Bye.